Greg, and I am with uh, Western Digital, which is part of SanDisk and uh, G Technology as well. We're all one company, one brand. Uh, and as most of you know, we make a series of uh, memory cards, hard drives, and storage solutions for the professional content creator and uh, the photographer filmmaker. So welcome to our event. Um, we're really pleased to have Cliff here. He's going to be teaching you some really cool skills uh, today. And uh, for those of you, if you enjoy this session, if you learn something, we actually have another session happening uh, with Cliff tomorrow um, where he's going to talk about um, flash versus continuous lighting, Cliff. Yeah, yeah. continuous lighting and uh, the benefits of both when, how, and why. Yep, so we got that, that registration's up on Sammy's website, and then uh, Cliff's doing two more workshops next week on the 23rd and 24th, and you can find more information on Sammy's website as well, and you can register for those as well. So uh, thank you, and for those of you who are here, and uh, stick around to the end because we have two raffles uh, coming up. So the first is going to be from us. It's one of our SanDisk uh, Extreme Pro Portable SSDs, one terabyte. Uh, this guy gets up to 2,000 megabytes read-write speeds. It's durable, three-meter drop protection. Cliff's going to probably mention it a little bit during uh, this session. And the second uh, one we have is from our guys here at Westcott. We've got JC uh, here as well. And um, he's going to be giving away an Apollo orb uh, at the end of this as well, which Cliff's going to speak to a little bit uh, throughout the session as well. Um, and then... If you guys have questions for Cliff, um, we ask that you do stay on mute because it's gonna be a little bit easier, but put the questions into the chat. I will be monitoring the chat, I'll be moderating it, and I'll be interrupting Cliff with questions as you guys uh, bring them up. So put your questions in the chat. And um, if they're product related from one of our products or one of Westcott's products, please um, put them in the chat too. JC will answer them or my counterpart, Peter Liebman, who's also here from Western Digital, he'll be answering them hopefully directly in the chat for you guys as well. So stick around till the end for the raffles and uh, put any uh, questions, comments, anything you want to do in the chat and uh, we'll have some fun this evening. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Cliff Mountner. Cliff, please uh, take it away. Awesome. All right, so let me throw this out there. Come on now. Oh, you got to love Zoom, guys, right? Uh, listen, thank you very much for joining me. Uh, I want to thank um, Sammy's. I want to thank Westcott. I want to thank Sandisk. And um, guys, just um, as an aside, um, it's a tough time out there for photographers. It's also a tough time out there for our retailers. Uh, so please, you know, um, take care of your local camera stores. Uh, these are uh, really, really difficult times, and uh, they support you. So, you know, we should support them as well. Uh, just uh, without further ado, I want to uh, also always, I'm thanking Nikon for being a Nikon ambassador for them. Very proud to be there. And um, got to oh, got to keep clicking here. There we go. So forgive my screen here. Uh, there we go. So I'm going to just go through a little bit of gear that I use here. And what I want to get down to is this. I do still carry speed lights. Yes, I use uh, SP5000s once in a while. Uh, I use my SP910s when I use flash on camera. But when I need more power, okay, Westcott is coming out with an FJ200, which is a 200 watt second flash. Uh, this strobe is able to give you approximately, approximately three times the power output of most speed lights. That is enormous, and I'll explain why in a little bit. I'm also uh, bringing my monopod and certain other accessories. I'm still a flash bender fan. You can get that through Sammy's. <clears throat> Mag mods are pretty good. And I also uh, carry a little teeny uh, pen light for light painting. All right. And uh, I'm still trying to, I'd love to get this off of here. There we go. Maybe I can just click. A little bit of technical talk, okay? Um, I'm going to go through this image in just a little while. This image, while it looks pretty simple, was a real pain in the butt 
to produce. I'm going to go through exactly what I did there. While you're looking at this, I suggest you sort of uh, uh, just kind of guess at what my settings might be, what I had to go through to make this picture. Uh, remember, I make these pictures at weddings. Remember that they're done uh, in a matter of seconds, and there is really no time to waste. And again, I don't know why I have to keep doing that. Uh, probably because, uh, Pete, I would imagine there's the nature of Zoom. I keep getting the waiting room alerts and I have to keep clicking. So it's not the quantity of light. It, light. Is, it is quality of light. Let me just go through that again. More so, light is not those, better those light. Those notifications aren't showing up on the, the window. So no, I'm, you I'm can see them, so you can ignore them. I'm clicking those people in as they come in. Right. No, I get that. But every time one comes up, I can't just hit my space bar. Oh, I see. All right. Okay, Sorry to advance it. <laughs> All right. So I'll uh, I'll be fine. I, I can improvise. Rui, can so, you take Cliff off as host? Those shouldn't pop up then. Well, then I will I still be able to screen yeah. share? Um, yes. Yes. I'll take him off as host, and if something, if you can't do it, let me know, and I'll I'll fix that. All Great. Right. Okay. All right. Whoever this is. Super. All right, here we go. I am um, not on. I have no camera on, and I have no intent. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you know what? It's just the way it is. Um, one of my favorite photographers of all time, Jay Maisel, uh, amazing, amazing man. Uh, he once said, the drama of light exists not only at what is in the light, but also what is left dark. If the light is everywhere, the drama is gone. This, I, I could not imagine a world without this man's wisdom. This really hit me like a ton of bricks. This is also a man who said, take a look at what you're looking at, which was fantastic for me. So let's take an image like this. If you look at this closely, you'll see that my favorite little detail, my favorite little highlight is on the little girl's face right in the middle. Without that little teeny highlight, I think this photograph is just ordinary. So my point here is, you got to know when a speed light is appropriate and when a speed light or a flash is not appropriate. Can you imagine what would have happened here if I had used a flash on this photograph? The shadow detail would have been destroyed. The whole image would have lost its texture, its dimension, and mood. So it is not something that I would want to use in that situation. Same thing here. Hey, just a quick reference there. That photo with the bridesmaid or the, the bride and the two flower girls, that's going to be the subject matter of Cliff's third seminar uh, in this series on the on February 23rd. So if you're interested in yes. learning how to create something like this in the three dimensionality, you want to come to Cliff's, you want to register for next week's event with Cliff as well. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Pete. So one more time here, this is an image where uh, I was uh, uh, talking to a, a mom and a mother of a bride uh, and, a, and a bride one day <clears throat> here in my studio. And they asked me if I had a photograph from uh, the Bellevue of the bridal suite. And this is a while back. This is the bridal suite. And <clears throat> she actually said, wow, it looks kind of dark. And I couldn't disagree. Sure, it's a little bit on the dark side. However, can you imagine if a flash was used here as well? The mood would have just been destroyed. And, you know, images like that, images like this, where it's the opposite. This is, uh, this is, shadows juxtaposed against highlights, whereas something like this is highlights juxtaposed against shadows. So when I'm photographing images like this, I can get away with available light beautifully. And this is all available light. This is just a giant sheer of drapes behind her. And I'm just exposing properly. So you have to think about when you want to go available, when you want to go with a flash, and even like we're going to talk about tomorrow, when you want to go continuous. So this is just a matter of exposure control without any extraneous lighting whatsoever, except what is already being presented to me. Once again, just taking those highlights juxtaposed against shadows. You're not going to be able to do this with a flash quickly. This would take two of them, and all of the spill would be really difficult to control as well. Uh, once again, this is just natural light. But now we can think about the possibility that we could do this also with a flash. And that's how I like to use my flashes, my speed lights, my, my big strobes, to maybe emulate, emulate natural light. Um, if you looked at this, you probably couldn't tell 
what kind of light this was. This was a continuous light, which I'm going to talk about tomorrow. So this is a little bit of a teaser. Direction creates dimension. So when we use our lights, we have to get them off the camera, try not to put them on camera, get them off the camera, and really start to create images that give you texture, dimension, and mood. So when we talk about flash and flash made easy, um, the different modes of the flash. I'm a manual guy, all right? Some of you might be TTL guys, that's fine. I'm not gonna get too deep into that. I really wanna talk about uh, some of these products and also how I implement them. This is less of a, uh, a elementary course. It might be a little bit uh, more of an intermediate course. The goal is to use it directionally to create that to direct, uh, to texture, dimension, and mood. When I talk about the balance of flash and ambient, which is the title of this little class, we have to understand how to control the ambient light. Understanding the ambient exposure value is critical. So we also have to understand that shutter speed has no effect on the flash output and the flash exposure. When we used to use um, light meters, okay, we would hold a light meter up, we would click on the light meter, but we would set it simply on ISO. We would click it, it would tell us what aperture value it was giving us. But if you remember, when you're using a flash meter in flash mode, it did not give us a shutter speed. It didn't care. It just doesn't care about what shutter speed you're on until that shutter speed is too slow and you're overexposing or you're too close to the ambient reading to begin with, okay? The shutter's effect on freezing action is also critical. When our shutter speed is too slow or it's too close to the ambient light reading, okay? We're gonna get blur, we're gonna get movement. The general rule of thumb for me is that when the shutter speed, okay, is sped up so that the, the camera settings are about two stops below the ambient light reading, okay, you can adjust your ISO, you can adjust your aperture, you can adjust your shutter speed. But when your camera settings are about a stop or two below the ambient light reading, you're gonna freeze the action. So, if you can visualize this for a moment, because this is really critical, pretend you're in a light vacuum. And if you can see me, uh, Pete, you can see me in the corner up there, right? Okay. Pretend you're in a light vacuum. There is no light in this room whatsoever. I turned all the lights in this room dark. Pretend I had a camera on a tripod and it was set to bulb, which is infinity. That shutter will stay open as long as that battery lasts. Pretend I had the camera lens pre-focused to about four feet. Pretend I had a tennis ball about four feet away. Pretend I had a strobe light. Remember the old strobe lights? They would just go like that. You would listen to Pink Floyd, maybe hit the bong and, uh, and enjoy it back in the 70s. You remember those days. Yes, I know. I said it in, in front of a couple hundred people, whatever. So that strobe light was going off. Okay, I had a tennis ball in front, there was no light in the room, and that strobe light was giving me, I don't know, F5.6. There's no shutter speed because the, the, the uh, shutter is going to be open on bulb. As long as I hold that, I'm fine. So I drop the tennis ball, the strobe is going off. That ball will be sharp each and every time that strobe goes off. Why? Flash duration. It's flash duration that freezes that action. Once I start to raise the ambient light reading by turning the lights up and it gets too close to the ambient light reading, it will no longer freeze that action because you're too close to the ambient light reading. Once I bring the lights back down, that flash or strobe duration will freeze the action. I know it's maybe a little bit difficult to understand, but try it. Try putting a flash on the camera. Try taking your shutter speed, speeding it up and have someone moving in front of you just like this and see what shutter speed you need to freeze the action. You could freeze the action at one full second if it's dark. Try it, okay? Just a little bit about that. 
Um, we'll talk a little bit about uh, flashes and flash power. Uh, one speed light at full power, okay, will give you the same output as 16 speed lights at 1 16th power. It's just a mathematical equation. So Westcott is coming out now with this light here. It's really, really very cool. Um, the FJ200 uh, has a lot of advantages to some of these foreign products that are coming in. Uh, mainly, I'm just going to say it, USA support. It is invaluable. When you have an issue with something, it's a lot easier to deal with an American company than, say, a company in Asia. It just is. All right. Uh, there are also other advantages. Uh, JC, would you like to just chime in and, and give us uh, a, a little, for instances, talk a little bit about recycle time, battery power, things like that. Can you just throw that out there? Sure. Can everybody hear me? I can, yes. Okay, great. Um, yeah, so the, the FJ wireless system has been out over the last year. It consists of the FJ80, which is our speed light, the FJ200, which is our 200 watt light, and the FJ400 currently. The big advantages that they have right now are the 200 and the 400 are ACDC. The 400 is the fastest ACDC 400 on the, in the planet at 0.9 seconds. The FJ200 is a half a second faster than its nearest competition. The FJ80 is the first round touchscreen speed light. What's really cool about all of these is that they'll work on any camera system that's out there. They have a universal trigger. And the other real cool thing, as far as I'm concerned, for somebody who mixes a lot of lights in my work, is that the 80, the 200, the 400 are all 5,500 Kelvin. They all power match. Power temperature, yep. They match from shot to shot. They match across the power range, which is a big, it's a big thing. I'm not going to JC, I'm going to interrupt here. And I'm going to say that once, I've also noticed that certain uh, flashes, once the power starts to die down, the battery starts to go a little bit lower or the recycle time is pushed, <clears throat> the color temperature is a little bit lower. And sometimes it gets a little bit too warm. So I'll just throw that out there. You know, you're dead on. I mean, and without talking shade about anybody else's stuff, because that's not what I'm here for. But it's just cool that if I want to use my 200 and my 400 together or my 80 and my 400 together, that the, t the colors match. Where with some other brands, uh, they don't. So and, then there's, and there's what Cliff said, which is that if you have a problem with a Westcott product, you can, you can reach out to me, you can reach out to Susie, that's our rep out there with Sammy's, or you can call Ohio, because that's where we're based. And somebody will answer you and get back to you, and we'll stand behind our product. Um, the triggers also, one of the things I, think I find interesting about the triggers, and again, this 200 is a new product. I'm not going to lie to anybody and say that I've been using this product for a long time. In fact, what I have here, this is a prototype. Um, but I have played around with it in the studio. I have not yet used it on a gig, but I really like the look of it. I like that it's round. I like the tube. And also, uh, this trigger is universal to any camera model that you have. That's pretty darn cool. It's not brand specific. So that's also very interesting. Uh, and it works with the 200 and it works with the 400. So that's pretty badass. Um, a couple other little things. I'm, I'm kind of a, a modifier guy. Um, and you can also control this in one tenth of a stop increments. Is that correct, JC? One tenth yeah. of a stop? Okay. As opposed to one third of a stop for other speed lights um, or other strobes. So um, I don't know if anybody can see here. Let's see if it has it here. Okay. So I'm a grid guy. Uh, it also has a filter holder within there, which is also important to me. And you guys are giving away this orb. Is that correct? No, we're giving away an Apollo orb. An Apollo orb. I'm like, wait a minute. What's this? This is just a modifier that comes with it. Now I feel really stupid. Now I'm so, going to talk about something that I, I, I do know about, well, which is uh, balancing flash and ambient, which is getting back to the nature of this, which is why people are watching. But um, I, I am very interested to see how this thing does, JC, because I do think that it is going to be a superior product for people compared to the Asian equivalents. There, I said it. Okay. Okay. Um, so one of the first things that we have to do when we're in any situation, and I know that there, there might be some wedding photographers that might be out there, balancing flash and ambient. If anybody took my workshop, you remember that we were in a hotel room and I had you take 
a photograph and adjust the shutter speed all the way from maximum sync, which is a 200th or 250, all the way down to like a half second when you were just overexposing because the ambient reading in the room was probably a, a, a 25th or 15th, okay? Going within that range and hitting the speed light, you will find out where you wanna be with your shutter speed in order to get a balanced room that balances your flash and your ambient light. Uh, there's nothing more distracting than taking a picture in a room where the background is just black. You can have a proper exposure, but your shutter speed could be way off. You need to slow it down if the background's really black. So what I'm gonna generally do, and this is sort of a, an, a, a formula, if you will, if you're in a situation and you're using any type of flash and you wanna have a natural looking scene where let's say it's room decor and you wanna have that prominent. All you need to do is get an overall ambient value, drop the exposure. Again, you can use shutter speed, you can use ISO, you can use aperture. I tend to like using shutter speed because I can control that very, very easily. I drop it down about one or two stops. At that point, I'm able to freeze the action. Um, I obtain the desired flash power. Generally, I'm a manual flash guy, but TTL can work, okay? TTL can work. Um, I use the desired flash power to expose the subject properly. Then I adjust the shutter speed to obtain the desired room ambiance. And the more you speed it up, the darker it's gonna get. The more you slow it down, the brighter it's gonna get. If you slow it down too much, you're not gonna freeze the action. If the freezing, is the, uh, freezing the action is desired, speed the shutter up a little bit or lower the ISO so you get below the ambient reading. Uh, if you're shooting in manual flash, keep in mind the flash output will always be consistent each and every single time. If you're in TTL, keep in mind that when you're changing the composition of your camera, okay, the meter is going to see different things. The meter might pick up a huge black patch of something and it's going to say, oh, I see a lot of darkness. This is a dark scene. Uh, we need more flash power. And then you may blow out and overexpose your subject. So I am a manual flash fan, although TTL can work if you're used to it. You just have to get used to it, okay? Finding balance. Uh, this is just a, a, a still I took from the internet. This is from uh, one of the Batman uh, films. This is the Joker, but... Obviously this is not flash, it's motion, motion picture, but I'm inspired by films. I'm inspired the way they light things. I'm inspired the way they balance this. I can recreate this image, not with uh, video lighting, but with flash very, very easily. Uh, it would be very simple to just take a, a speed light uh, <clears throat> to camera right and uh, set it on a particular power and set your camera settings so that you can emulate this. And then it's just a matter of getting color temperatures correct so that everything is balanced. Case in point, this is a very, very good example of my need to get the balance just right. Uh, this is on uh, top of a roof in New York City, obviously. And what I was able to do uh, is, uh, it was very important to this couple, it was a really foggy night, as you can see. And I wanted to get the New Yorker sign and the Empire State Building in there, and I wanted to expose the subjects properly. Now, I could have done it a million ways. I could have taken a photograph and exposed them properly, but my shutter speed or my exposure value could have been such where the background was too dark. So what did I do? I just slowed my shutter. I'm still a couple stops below the ambient. I have a nice frozen sharp subject and I'm also able to see uh, the New Yorker in the background, okay? Let's see, why won't it, oh, here we go. I'm a big fan of using grids. Uh, the, uh, the Westcott product does have a really, really slick grid that comes with it. It's magnetic on the front, and it literally just slides in, a little Bowens mount on the front. I think that's pretty cool. From my actual flashes, I use my mag mods, and you can also get those at Sammy's. And it's really to control the light. It was critical. This is one Brooklyn Bridge Hotel. Balance has never 
ever been more of an example than this particular image where I had to get the New York City skyline. Otherwise, I had answers that were going to be uh, needed to be given to the client. Why can't we see New York? Um, if you don't have this skill, you need to obtain it. It's really simple. Once again, it's just a matter of getting your shutter speed right. I used a grid so that just a circle of light was hitting the subject's faces and just a little bit below them. I also used the grid to avoid spill so it didn't spill too much. Balance. This is a really cool uh, space in, in the city. Um, and I wanted my flash, the output, to match the intensity of the candlelight. The only way to do this is finding balance. So my shutter speed, I probably was around a 30th of a second, somewhere in that neighborhood, probably a 30th, 2.8, around 1600. That's probably the same, um, the same intensity as the candles. Uh, if my shutter speed was too fast, I lose those candles. Um, your room, you're in a, uh, a large room, you're in a, a, a ballroom during a first dance. Um, there's no way I want to go too fast with my shutter speed. I don't have to in order to freeze action. Uh, you can still see the faces of all of the subjects. I'm about two stops under the ambient reading. My assistant is camera left pointing a flash on a flat with a flash bender over it and hitting the subject with a little kiss of light. I'm probably only at about eighth power for those wondering where I start with my power settings. Um, so if I was uh, using um, either the FJ or another product at this point, I am, by the way, using 200 watt second lights for my family formals, for my reception lighting now. And I probably would only need about a 16th power for something like this, or maybe even one thirty second power. Why does that help over say a, a 70 watt second or a 65 watt second flash? Well, recycle time recycle time big time because I don't need half power or quarter power or full power. Remember these 200 watt second lights or three times the power. He's doing his ATC course. All right. So I, I don't know. Uh, somebody, want, somebody had a question there. Somebody probably just unmuted themselves. That's all good. So this was important here for me. Okay. Sometimes when I talk about this image, I confuse myself, okay? So, JC, uh, you're a flash guy. Um, what, do you think, what do you think my shutter speed was here? Somewhere around what? Half a second. Okay. And um, you, are, you are very close. And if I would have asked Pete, what would you say that you're, uh, well, you know photography a little bit. What do you think the shutter speed might have been here? I would have said one or two seconds. Okay. So you, you're, you're, you both have the idea, but what happened to me in this particular instance, all right? I had to get the carousel. It was critical for these people to have the carousel. It's the Please Touch Museum in Philadelphia. And what I wanted to do, well, can you see it here? Oh, boy. You know what? Everything is covering this. Well, I think it's probably one-tenth of a second. Is that correct? Uh, can 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 you guys see the? Uh, uh, I guess the the host can't see it, right? Quarter second. Okay, quarter it's a quarter second. second. Okay. So what was happening to me in this image? By the way, I can't see any of my photo mechanic information uh, because uh, the hosts are basically covering it. So I'm just going to have to guess out there, and I might have to uh, go uh, stop screen sharing for a minute to, to move it to the left side. In any case, these bulbs were so bright. Okay, they kept overexposing everything at slow shutter speeds. I was at a 30th of a second. I was at a 15th of a second. I was uh, at like uh, 400 ISO. I am all the way down to, what does it say? ISO 50, is that correct? Probably ISO 50 and F22 because I'm using such a slow shutter speed, okay? I wanted the, the merry-go-round to go round and round so I can get that movement, but yet the flash was needed to freeze the action of the subject. So this is a combination of ambient light where 
the lights on the merry-go-round on the carousel are going around and flash freezing the action. The subjects are in an area where I had the camera set two stops below the ambient reading so that flash would freeze the action. But I kept having trouble with the output. I could not believe I needed F22 and a quarter of a second at ISO 50 to get this image. This was one giant pain in the butt and it probably took me three or four different tries when it usually takes me one or two. So this confused the heck out of me. So um, if you don't get these things on the first try, please understand that even, you know, 35 year old, uh, 35 year pros have some trouble with doing some of these. So Cliff, there's no yep. post-production on that then that's. Oh no, there's no, this is this. Po thanks for asking that. This is all in camera. There's no post here. Uh, my, now my, my studio manager uh, put it in Lightroom, put the raw, raw file in Lightroom and just processed it. Uh, for contrast adjustments and, and a little bit of white balance, but there is no motion added in Photoshop. None, none whatsoever. No, none at all. But thank you for that question. All right. We'll talk a little bit about high speed sync. This is something that uh, one day I saw Joe McNally at Photo Plus um, explain high speed sync to probably 300 people looking on. Brave man. Uh, and, and, and he's one of the only people that I know that I can actually do it. Uh, and he, he explained it beautifully. So really what it is in simplest terms is the camera's ability to use a flash at shutter speeds faster than the camera's native sync speeds, usually around 200th or 250th, okay? Um, when you want creative control, uh, say making a background, uh, the depth of field go way, way down, Sometimes we need to speed our shutters so that we can open our apertures, okay? What happens then, we need to adjust, uh, if we're using flash in that situation, we're gonna go into high-speed sync because the, the uh, flash will not sync faster than a 250th unless you go into high-speed sync mode. Uh, you'll achieve a more shallow depth of field when uh, you have wider apertures, okay, but you're gonna need a faster shutter speed or lower ISO or both. Your, your, uh, your flash is gonna lose power though. You can read all that, but basically uh, the faster the shutter speed, the less effective the power will be on your flash. That's layman's terms. So let's say you're using a shutter speed of say one five thousandth of a second, okay? That is going to give you much less power output than if you're using a shutter speed of say 1,000th of a second. So sometimes when you're getting that much power loss, your light source A, needs to be powerful to begin with, and B, you're gonna need to get closer often because the power output is diminished as you increase your shutter speed, all right? That's the layman's terms there. So the faster the shutter speed, the less power actually gets through those little blades. Uh, JC, would you say that's a, a, a decent explanation of high-speed sync? Or because if, if you have anything to add, uh, you know, you are, you're a flash guy in general. So, uh, I am. That you was know. perfect. You know, okay. That's perfect. Cool. Thank you. Um, JC just doesn't want to explain it because it's a pain in the ass. No, I'm just, I'm teasing you. I'm teasing, dude. No, I, I never heard anybody explain it the way Joe does. And uh, Joe, uh, uh, Joe's the man. Uh, he's the man in many ways. So um, this image was taken uh, a few weeks ago, actually, uh, at a wedding, a real wedding, where uh, the typical uh, example of using high-speed sync, in this case, to bring the sky down. I didn't want everything completely whitewashed. It was really, really, really bright out, okay? I was using a 200 watt second flash. It was very close to my subject. And... Um, Let's see, uh, what is, um, I, again, I cannot, you know what I'm gonna do here? I'm gonna get out of this, I'm gonna take this, I'm gonna pull it here, and now I can pretty much see everything. Okay, so I'm using uh, 1250th of a second there, 1250th of a second, and I have uh, no idea why I just wrote that there. Uh, you see a big red line going through it? Well, I don't know what happened there. Um, so I'm using 1 1250th of a second ISO 50. So that's very, very low on the ISO, but it enabled me to get uh, 
the, um, the, the shutter speed fast enough. I wanted some shallow depth of field, but I wanted that sky nice and dark. In this particular instance, a little bit of night shooting, okay? I wanted to balance the flash and ambient. It's the opposite of what you just looked at with regard to the snow. It's nighttime, and if you look here, I used 1 30th of a second. I didn't need high-speed sync, and my flash was probably just a little kiss of light, maybe 1 32nd power. Here's a little bit of a, um, you know, a, kind of a head slap. Um, the more light you have, the more light you need. The darker it is, the less flash you need. So the more light you have, the more flash you'll need. The less light you have, the less flash you're going to need. So less power when you're in darker conditions. It's almost kind of the reverse of what your natural line of thought would be. So talk a little bit about family portraits. This is my family. This is probably the biggest head scratcher uh, when it comes to wedding photography. People don't like doing them. Photographers are, are um, intimidated by them. They just want to get them over with. Um, they're simple. They're so easy. Uh, these just stand the test of time. These, these are, uh, that's my parents. Terrible, terrible photograph for them. But they're important. I'm showing you this because this is terrible. This is an absolutely brutal family picture. This is a, a series I did for Nikon years ago. Uh, this is a uh, uh, Nikon behind the scenes video that I did. And this is a great example of how not to do a family portrait. Because even though it's pretty much a proper exposure, okay, without that flash fill, it looks terrible. Look how much better this looks, okay? And I'm going to show you how that's done. So remember I was talking earlier about the balance of flash and ambient and how you want to get an exposure value of the ambient scene to begin with and then use a flash to get a proper exposure on the subjects. Well, what happened to me in this situation, I was nailing everything. This looks great. But every once in a while, okay, I get a misfire. So I thought I'd share with you the fact that this was indeed one two hundredth of a second, 5.6 at 800. This was at the, this is the second wedding at the Four Seasons Philadelphia. And if you look here, okay, it's pretty much the same. 200, five, six. Oh, I, this is 1,000. Okay, so it's really just a third of a stop different. Boom. So here you go, here you go. The only difference is that I used the proper quantity of light to fill in the faces. So this is really the formula that I use for family photos. This is what it would look like if I tried to just use available light. If I tried to slow the shutter or get a proper exposure on their faces here, the background would have been very, very distracting. It would have been overexposed. Okay, uh, I still use uh, these flash benders sometimes for my regular speed lights, all right? And I also use that uh, on my 200 watt second light. And I think Sammy has these as well. Uh, I haven't tried the new Westcott modifiers, but you can count on me doing so. Once again, same kind of thing here, uh, same exposure. All I did was use a speed light. All right, high speed sync for a family session. This is a 640th of a second, okay? This is not high speed sync. This is before I put a 200 watt second light in my bag, okay? Notice the, uh, the, the oh, actually, yeah, the shutter speed here was only one 200th of a second. Today, I probably still use a similar shutter speed, but um, I could go a little bit faster if I wanted to. Here's an interesting scenario. All right. This is Glenford Mansion. This is right before I was doing the family and formal photos where I'd want to see their faces. Okay. This is just a regular good old silhouette. If we look here, this is a shutter speed of 1 32 hundredth of a second. 
ISO 640. My aperture was f4.5. Now, for this next frame, I needed to get their faces properly exposed. Now, I didn't have more than a 200 watt second light with me. So what does that mean? If I tried to go in high speed sync, I would not have been able to get a proper exposure because that 200 watt second light would not have given me enough power output. I would have needed more like a 500 watt second light. It was very, very bright out. The brighter the scene, the more light I need. If you look at these settings, I went back down to 2 50th of a second because I knew I couldn't go into high speed sync because I wouldn't be able to get their faces properly exposed. So I went down into normal sync speed, okay, got the light as close as I could, and believe it or not, I took the modifier off and went direct flash at the subject, okay, and just made sure that the light was spreading out far enough to go from one end of the frame to the other. So high-speed sync sometimes won't work for you if you're in situations where you just don't have enough power to do it. And I needed a lot of power here. I couldn't diminish the 200 watt seconds, all right? And once again here, it's a very bright scene, okay? I could not use high-speed sync there. Uh, in this situation, this is a, a lovely spot in Philly, one of my favorites. Um, I wanted to show how I like to balance things by using a grid. Okay, I really like the look of the grid. And if you can look here, um, I love the use. Why is, I don't know why my cursor's showing up now, yay. Um, I love the look of just that little bit of light on here. This is a two, 200 watt second light uh, from above on a grid, just giving a splash of light and filling in right here while I made everything darker with my shutter speed. And here you'll see it's one four hundredth of a second. So I'm not losing a whole lot of power. All right. So it's basically two thirds of a stop faster than my sync speed. Two thirds of a stop faster. Um, sometimes uh, I need, uh, by the way, this is the, the, the grid that they make. Sometimes I need gels. Uh, behind me right now, I've got a little uh, half CTO gel on a, on a Stella light, which is lighting me in the front and in the back here. Uh, that's another example of the grid here, and that's my settings here. One thirty-two hundredth of a second at f 1.8. Uh, I know that sounds like it's very fast, and it is, but I was able to have uh, my assistant holding that flash really close to the subject. Okay, I really do like to work with assistants. I need them. Uh, so that flash is really, really close here. And again, that's very, very fast for uh, flash sync, so that light had to get really close to the subject. So my simple family formula for family photos, I look for some open shade. I look for bright, simple, neutral backgrounds for separation. I like to use the longest lens possible so I can isolate my composition. Uh, in manual mode, I underexpose by one to two stops. And then I use manual flash to give me a consistent output, all right? So right now, what I wanna do, I wanna go down a little bit here. Let's see, just for the sake of time, a little bit of reception lighting here. Okay, um, this is where it's really critical, wedding photographers, to control your ambient light. I used uh, a grid here okay, because I'm in the Franklin Institute and it's made of marble and I was spilling light all over the place with um, my flash bender. So I used the grid and you can see that everything just came down nicely and it wasn't bouncing all over the place. Um, you can freeze action as long as you're under the ambient reading very, very easily. So this was a campaign I did for, uh, I guess it was the 780 and um, uh, this was also very controlled lighting. I needed this flash here. Uh, and actually, you know what? Tomorrow night, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show how I tried to do this with a continuous light and it just wouldn't work. 
This is a wonderful example of controlling the light with a grid so that it's just kissing right here. When I didn't use the grid and I wasn't close enough, I was spilling it all over the flowers and I didn't want those lit. So control is really, really important. The other thing I did here, I sped the shutter up fast enough so that I was able to bring all of these, uh, uh, these lights, these B lights on the curtains way, way, way down. Uh, as I would slow the shutter, these things would become much brighter uh, and give me some distracting backgrounds there. The thing that's important to know is that you're never, never know. You're always sort of feeling your way. It's one of my, one of my favorites. So um, for those of you that have been following and understanding how shutter speed affects your background, uh, in this particular situation, I went to the fastest sync that I could use in this situation was 250th to stay in my native sync speed because there was a lot of crap going around back here. And so while it might be a little bit dark, which it is, I wanted to speed it up deliberately. In this situation, I didn't want a black background. So instead what I did, I used a nice, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, you know what? This is a 200th of a second. Another good example of um, uh, making sure that things were balanced, if I slowed it up too much, this would have been too bright. Okay, so I'm correcting myself there. So just a couple other examples of balancing light inside receptions. Controlling shutter speed, controlling backgrounds so that they look natural. Okay. This is also the same if you're using flash in the corporate world, corporate headshots. I wanted that, uh, uh, that gobo on the background to look just right. If my shutter speed was too slow, I wouldn't have been able to get it properly. So this is just a 200th. If I was too slow, this would have been too bright. Okay. Um, flash, continuous, available. I'm going to talk a lot about this tomorrow night. Uh, I go available when I can if the quality of light is there. Uh, I'll go available um, if I don't need to freeze the action and the quality of light is there. I'll use a flash when I need to freeze action because of the flash duration. When I'm using slower shutters, I need the duration to freeze the action. I'll use a flash when I need more power than continuous can give me. I'll use continuous, like I'm going to show tomorrow night, when the power is sufficient and the ambient levels are what I desire, okay? If it does the job with quality, okay? Flash or not to flash? That is the question. Um, I did not have an assistant with me here. So I did not use a flash here. I could not use a flash here. I would have liked to have used a flash here. I would have liked to have used a flash here, but I didn't have an assistant. My assistant went home already. I'm basically showing you some mistakes I've made and where things could have been improved. Definitely could have been improved here. I should not have tried to get away with just available light because this could have really used a little grid spot, okay? Um, I didn't need a whole lot going on here because this is a flash coming and hitting them with a little grid spot in a very controlled way. Shutter speed adjusting to the city's ambiance. Same thing here, just balancing with my shutter. And I was a 30th at 4.5 at ISO 2000 there. Very important here to have my shutter speed right. Once again, another good example of getting an ambient reading getting things to where you want them, and just adding a little bit of flash at those same settings. High speed sync, 2000 to 35, because I wanted to bring the background down. So Pete, I can start taking some questions. Why don't you throw some my way and uh, kind of take it from there. Hey All Cliff, right. JC is gonna kind of do, uh, I'll be your, your WFAN guy. Uh, so okay. Michelle, who's a long time listener and a first time caller. She says in the tree photo with the slow sync, was there one light for the bride and one for the groom or just one light? That was one light because the, the uh, let me get something up. I'll just get a frame up here. Um, it was only one light in that tree photo, mainly because the, all of the, the Christmas lights, okay, the Christmas lights were bright enough where I didn't have to throw a light on the tree at all. And it was just one light controlled on a grid 
a fairly bit of a distance away so that the assistant can stay out of the frame hitting the subject. Okay, so that was only one light. Very cool. Our friend Cliff um, says, you know, from one cliff to another says, are you using grids for those night shots or are you using more bear? Um, you, I've never used bear, no. I always modify my light in one way or the other, uh, unless, unless, like I was at that uh, Delaware River front with those groomsmen, sometimes modifiers trap light. When I need all the power I can get, I mean all the power I can get, like in that scenario, I'll take all the modifiers off and just go direct bear. I almost never do it, but I never say never. Very cool. We have another question from Jim K, who I, I, I gave my answer, and I think it's going to match you because we've actually talked about it. But I still want to hear from you. Uh, do you prefer high-speed sync or a neutral density filter in those situations? Uh, okay. What a great question. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, a neutral density filter will only help you when you are not using a flash. High speed sync, okay? You use a neutral density filter, you're just gonna need more light to get through it. So neutral density filters, uh, I would much rather use high speed sync in that situation, without question. Um, all you're really doing, uh, you, yes, you're, you're bringing everything down. Um, what, would it help you? I suppose it could in theory, because you can go to your native sync, but you're still gonna need a hell of a lot of power. JC, what's your answer? So I said my own personal answer is I'd rather use high-speed sync 95% of the time because I don't want to add color shift or put more light in front of my, uh, more, I put light, but I meant glass in front of my lens. Every stop of ND needs to be overcome with flash power as well. Correct. Which makes for a situation where I have to place the flash so close that it controls my shot choices. Right. You know, it's changed everything for me. So I agree yeah. with you hundred percent. Yeah. The, 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 the more you use density filters, um, neutral density filters, the more flash power you're going to need anyway. Right. So. Um, we've got Chris Hirschman, who I'm wondering if this is the Chris Hirschman that we both know and love. It, it probably is because, because Chris helped me tremendously try to get uh, my crap together with regard to uh, uh, getting this webcam to look halfway decent. And I do appreciate Chris it. Chris would be the right guy for that. And if yes, it is, is Chris, howdy, brother. Haven't seen you in a while. Nikon Ambassador Chris Hirschman has a question. He says, do you ever use a tripod on any of the examples you show where you were balancing the long exposures with the flash? Great question. No need for a tripod in any of those situations. Why, JC? Why? Because, because, the flash duration. because the flash duration freezes the action. In the very, very first scenario I gave where I was in a light vacuum and I was on bulb, okay? Bulb, no shutter speed whatsoever. That strobe light, the duration of it was freezing the, the tennis ball that I would drop. So basically, I don't need a tripod to freeze the action because I let the flash duration do it for me. Great question. So Mike McGevna has got what I think is a great question because it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I always say revel in failure and learn from them. His question is, how do you determine the proper flash exposure for reception images since you shoot manual? Oh, great question. Okay. Um, number one, I'm going to say experience. Okay. I'm also going to, um, I'm going to quote uh, a really, really strong uh, flash educator and just a great photographic ed educator. I'm going to steal his quote, but I got to give a footnote. A guy named Zach Arias, really cool guy, uh, wonderful teacher. And, um, one of the things that my students would ask me, they'd say, well, God, I don't know where to set my, you know, my flash. H how much power? Uh, where do I start? Zach would say, start somewhere. So with, the, with experience, I know that I'm probably going to start somewhere between, with the 200 watt second lights, somewhere between an eighth, uh, I'd say an eighth power is a good place to start depending upon your distance that your flash is to your subject, try an eighth power, try a 16th power. You might need a quarter power. 
I don't know. So certainly between a quarter and a sixteenth, and that's in that two stop range, is a very very good place to, to start. I have no problem, by the way, going into a reception with my Z6s and my Z6s and, and shooting the whole reception at ISO 1600 or 2000. Why is that important? Because when you can get away with a little higher ISO, which is very low noise on these new cameras, I can use less flash power and I can get better recycle time. And I can also save my batteries. So, this is a really wonderful thing compared to the days when I was using 400 ISO film and I would go through batteries in my flash like crazy. So that's also another benefit. Great question. Okay. Uh, there was another good one there. Hold on a second. Um, and I think that just if I can add to that real quick without doing anything, I think that yeah. Cliff's point earlier really plays into that question, which is how much ambient light is there? If there's a lot of ambient light, you know you're going to start off at at, one, at full power. At you need more power. power. That's right. If you're in some place that's really pretty dark, you know your power is that much more powerful against the dark, if that makes sense. It does. And I'm going to I'm going to throw this one out there, too, for, for you wedding photographers out there and portrait photographers. The perfect scenario where you're going to need power, it's one of my least favorite scenarios to shoot, which is an outdoor tent. You're outside and the entire area outside of the tent, it's daylight. And under the tent, it's nothing but crappy flat light. But it's bright. You need fill. You need power. A flash is not going to do the job unless you have multiple. A 200 watt second strobe will be my choice in that situation. Okay. Um, Eunice is asking if you can go back and show some of those images that were not correct so that you can talk about why you kept on working until you got it right, which I think is really a valuable thing. Sure. And while you're looking for that, Jim had a question about how much light is being lost using a grid. Uh, JC, you answer that question. Yeah. So the, the, the answer to that, Jim, it's gonna depend on how many degrees your grid is. Um, it's not as simple as one stop for this many degrees or two stops for that many degrees. So to answer that question effectively, I'd, I'd say a half a stop is what I'm thinking, but it's still direct. So I, you're not really losing, you're not really losing power. You're losing range, uh, range a little bit. It's still direct. You're probably not losing anything in the end. It, it, I, I never tested it. You know what? Do you have a better answer than that, Cliff? I feel like I just uh, pooped in the bed. No, I, I think um, uh, certain soft boxes, you're going to lose light, okay, without question. So I think that's uh, – you're definitely losing something. I think with a grid, you're losing just a little. You're losing, losing – um, if you guys can see this here, this is a grid. This is my favorite modifier, okay. I use it quite often, um, you know, the Magmods, and this is the new Westcott here. Um, so I do use this quite a bit. And really what it's doing, guys, it's reducing the angle, reducing the dispersion. And to answer that person's question uh, before about screwing up and to incorporate the use of grids in this particular answer, I would love, can you, JC, you can see the cursor? I cannot. You cannot, okay. Basically on their faces right here, on their faces, I would love to have placed a little circle of light filling in there, balancing the flash with the ambient there. Uh, that was a mistake on my part, but again, uh, it was late in the night. Uh, you know, he gave her the dip. I didn't have an assistant holding a flash with a grid handy. I think it's fine. Could it have been better? Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, another situation, I think they're probably talking about the carousel photo um, because that is sort of a, it was the photo that was uh, shown to get people to sign up for this. Just once again, where I was screwing up. Okay. Number one, I had no trouble with the ambient light reading in this room whatsoever. That's first and foremost. But when I was trying to 
uh, freeze the bulbs, okay? I was, I'm not, not freeze the bulbs. I was trying to get the, the bulbs to get motion. They were getting plenty of motion, all right, but they were overexposed. So the trick here, guys, was to bring down. I had to bring down the uh, luminance, the output of those bulbs on the carousel. And the only way to do that from an ambient light standpoint was to speed the shutter. And that wasn't going to give me the movement that I wanted. So then what I have to do, I had to bring the exposure value, okay, of the subject up to such a point, okay, where uh, I was at one quarter of a second, F22 on ISO 50. F22 and ISO 50. That quarter of a second allowed me to have the bulbs moving and the carousel moving. And because the subject was probably 20, 25 feet away from the carousel, the flash was not hitting the carousel, freezing the carousel. It was only hitting the subject, freezing the subject. And I had a nice exposure at that point in time, after screwing this up three or four times, I had a good exposure on the subject, freezing the action at a quarter of a second because they were in a very dark area. I had an exposure value that was allowing me to have uh, not only the bulbs properly exposed, but slow enough for them to show movement. So I hope that explains that a little bit better than I did the first time, because I'm not going to kid you. I confuse myself when I try to explain this photo. Other questions? Edward we says, was this an example where it might have been better to use an ND filter? Well, um, no, because I still needed to get F22 at ISO 50 out of my flash. That's a lot of power. You know how close that thing had to be? That's a 200 watt second light. That's at full power. If it, that, that's, you're more or less beating the sun in that you're trying to match the exposure of that light. In Correct. F22 at ISO 50. That's, uh, that's a lot of light, man. So an ND filter would not have helped me here because then I would have, and by the way, I didn't have a, a Profoto B1. I didn't have a 500 watt second light. I only had a 200 watt second light. Well, I, I could probably hook you up with a 400 watt light. Yeah, I bet you could. There you go. <laughs> Next question. Um, did you use a light meter to check the light level at the carousel shot? I did not. Um, it, you know, uh, one of the, one of the advantages to, uh, uh, to being experienced, um, is to go and, and shoot things, um, and just kind of wing it. Now I got it on the third try. Would a light meter have helped me? Maybe, maybe, uh, a light meter is a good thing. Um, I'm not going to kid you. A, a light meter could have helped. Would it have helped me in this situation? I don't think so, because I probably would have screwed it up anyway, truthfully. Um, this image here, this is a nice, uh, nice example of just playing around with shutter speeds and flash distance freezing action. Okay, I twisted my camera and it was like a 30th of a second. So that's another example of flash distance freezing action. The closer the light, the more it's going to freeze the action, just as the duration will freeze the action. Other questions? Any more on there? Carlo has a question. Keep them and coming. And this is going to be our last question because Pete's okay. uh, given us the... The stink eye. No, no, no. He's saying, you know, you've done an amazing job and this has felt like 12 minutes when it was an hour. Okay. It's the best compliment you can get. Um, awesome. It's it, all right. Um, there's two actually. One's for me and one's for you. So I'll let you do the first one. Okay. Uh, do you ever use rear camera flash? I think they mean rear curtain flash. Rear curtain sync. Um, yep. I do. Okay. However, now uh, th there are different philosophies about rear curtain flash. One philosophy is why take it out of rear curtain sync at all? Because when you're actually 
having doing motion and dancing and and just people moving rear curtain sync is the way to go because you will have movement and then frozen subject it is a much more natural looking scenario uh, aka uh, you know the the, the road runner or something of that sort it looks much more natural you'll have motion and then frozen subject instead of um, frozen subject and then the motion in front. However, the reason I don't use rear curtain, let's say I'm in, uh, I'm at like a 15th of a second in a reception with my flash on camera, just getting grip and grins and just moments. And I, I still put a flash on the camera uh, sometimes at a reception when I'm just trying to get some candid stuff I hate that word, but you know, I'm trying to do more, uh, capture more moments. Candid, uh, don't get me started with candidates. Um, great example would be if someone wanted to, uh, there's always a grandmom shot, okay? And the grandmom and the bride, they're meeting towards the end of the evening. Uh, the bride is going to grandmom, grandmom sitting here in her chair, and she reaches up to the bride kind of like this. She goes, oh, hello, Tatskala. She does that. She reaches up, touches the bride's chin. If she reaches up and touches the bride chin, when she touches the bride chin and pulls it away and the flash fires, I miss the touch of the chin because I'm in rear, certain, rear curtain sync and that flash isn't firing until grandma pulls her hands away from the chin. So in that situation, at a 15th of a second, because I want to get a balance of flash and ambient light, I am not going to get the moment. I'm going to miss the moment. That's so that's why I don't use I, rear curtain sync all the time. That's the best explanation of why I wouldn't that I've ever heard. I think that's really a great answer. Thank you. Um, so Carlo's question was, and I think we can both answer this actually. Um, for someone starting out, would you recommend learning on an FJ80, a speed light, before jumping into something with more power like an FJ200? And my answer is that I'm of the belief that the worst place in the world for a light source is in the hot shoe of the camera. And that doesn't mean that I don't love the FJ80. I do love speed lights. I did a ton of speed light stuff when I was the MPS rep at Nikon for seven years because we made speed lights. So I'm not anti speed light and I love the FJ80. But since I'm almost always going to put something off, unless I'm shooting an event or a wedding, in which case I might, I'm going to use two lights because I'm going to use something for ambient and something for my direct you know, light on the subjects. I'd probably always go to the, the 200 if I was picking out because I have a lot more power. I can beat the sun, so to speak, which you can do with a speed light, but well, do it better. I'm going to answer for a second, JC, and I'm going to just tell you, light is light. Okay, light is light. This puppy just has more power. As long as and if you can learn how, if you're just starting out and you start to learn how to use manual off-camera flash, it will be the best decision you've made from a lighting standpoint when you are beginning your photographic education. Uh, it, it, is, it is so valuable to learn this stuff at the beginning. And the most important thing really is get the damn flash off the camera's hot shoe. Get it off the plane. Absolutely. Great. Um, Pete, did you have uh, something to give away here? Yeah, we got two things to give away, actually. All right. So, all right, guys. Uh, so, big thank Pete, you. To before, be Pete, before you give it, before you do that, I, I do uh, want to ask if if you find this information valuable. Tomorrow night, I'm going to be talking about um, my Stella Pro lights and and the differences between using continuous light sources, which I use a lot right now and speed lights, which I also use a lot right now, and the decisions behind when and why I use each. So I just thought I'd throw that out there. Uh, and you can find it on the link uh, on, on Sammy's site. And that's also uh, brought to you by SanDisk and uh, Sammy's and uh, Stella Light in Motion. So thanks, Pete. Yep. And uh, if you guys want to scroll up through the chat, there is um, a link to Cliff's event tomorrow night to register for in there. Uh, and then there's also a second link just to the Sammy's page in general so that if you want to sign up for his the two events we have with him next week, you can find them all there as well. So uh, oh. please, uh, please do sign up and please join us. Um, so as for the raffle.